I come to you in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. In an initial reading of today's three readings, Old Testament, Epistle, and Gospel, these readings seem to be rather disparate. That is, they're hard to, there's no common theme, it appears. I mean, if you look at the Old Testament reading, this is an elegy by David about over the grief that he was experiencing over the death of King Saul and Jonathan. In our epistle reading, Paul is urging the Corinthians to follow through on an agreement, a promise they had made to send a, a gift of money to the church in Jerusalem that evidently it had, uh, was suffering from uh, uh, bad weather, uh, a famine in, in the area. Uh, this happened several times in the uh, 50s uh, AD. So the second one is about money. The third one, in our gospel reading, uh, tells us of two healings, uh, both women, one a little 12-year-old girl, another a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. Uh, normally when I preach, or if I'm looking ahead for, at the readings on Sunday, I go first to the collet. To give, us a th to give me a theme about what holds these three together, or usually often it is two, the Old Testament reading and the Gospel reading. But the apostles and the prophets, it doesn't help a whole lot with this. The, the colic is totally unrelated, I think, to the three readings. So, so how can we put them together? And it may be that I have been uh, looking at these scriptures sort of through the lens of my own grief this week as I was preparing for this sermon. I've been very grieved over the uh, reports of Diane Stanton and her uh, coming uh, death, her time uh, in hospice and... Uh, and you may not, you may know she did pass away last night around four o'clock this morning. And uh, for those of you who do not know Diane, Diane is the, uh, was the wife of our former bishop, Jim Stanton, one of my best friends. And, uh, and I've been journeying with him, uh, especially during this time. And what I determined held these three readings together was all of them were written premised upon tragedy. So it's tragedy that motivated what we have to read. In our Old Testament reading, Saul and Jonathan have been killed in battle with the Amalekites. And Saul was the king. Saul had been chasing David as well because he thought that David was usurping his kingship and wanted to be king of Israel. Jonathan was his closest friend, and he's grieving in this elegy over the death of Saul and Jonathan. And our epistle of the church in Jerusalem is in need of financial assistance because of it, it's a twofold tragedy uh, one is the of course the, the the poverty of the church in Jerusalem but the other is the, the fact that the Corinthians had promised to give a financial gift to the church at Corinth a year ago and they still hadn't followed through with that and so there's a base there's a Paul is teaching them about how, what it means to be generous and to follow up on your word. And then the gospel reading, we have the healing of a 12-year-old girl, uh, the daughter of Jairus, the, uh, the, the leader of the synagogue, sort of like our senior warden, and then of a woman with hemorrhages 
that she had been hemorrhaging for 12 years. Three different kinds of tragedies. And so I want to focus uh, particularly on our gospel reading as the lens through which to view this whole notion of tragedy and how we respond to that, but also it's sort of my reflection wrestling with um, the, uh, as I was preparing it, the, 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 the time that Diane Stanton has been, has been uh, suffering from this illness of cancer in her body and now is with the Lord in his greater presence. Uh, so Diane, it was a short diagnosis. She'd been diagnosed for, a year, for three, three months ago and were hopeful about the treatment and it did not come about. And so I'm, I'm just, I'm reeling in that. I've been praying for her healing and uh, when I was with her, I prayed for her healing. People in this parish have been praying for her healing. People all over the world, because her reach was so far, have been praying for her healing. And now she is healed in God's greater presence. But that's not the kind of healing that I was praying for initially. And many, many people. And the, th the challenge is this. I believe that God heals. I believe God can heal, and I believe God does heal. Several years ago, when I was the rector of the church in Fredericksburg, I had a woman come in. Her name was Pat. And she had visited our church on Sunday, enjoyed the service, said, I'd like to meet with you this week. We made an appointment. She came into my office, and she was, she was hobbling a bit. She was like 42, 45 years old. She had a bad back, and, and it, it was just terrible. It, she had thrown it out a couple, two days before, and now she was just hobbling. So we visited for a while, and I got to know her, learned her story. And before she left, I said, could I pray for you, oh, for, your, for your back? She said, well, sure. And so I started praying for her and prayed for her, asked her how she felt. Yeah, you know, I'm polite. Yeah, I feel, feel a little better. And then she left. And then about three minutes later, she was back at my door. And uh, she, I said, well, did you need something else, Pat? She said, could I come in and talk to you? I said, well, sure. Sit down. We talked. She said, my back is healed, and I didn't expect it. I came in, and I talked with you, and got to know you, and then you asked to pray for me, and you started praying, and I thought, oh, Lord, what have I done? This crazy man is praying for my back. Am I going to get out of here? And... So she said, and so we finished praying, and I couldn't get out of there quickly enough. And I got in my car, I opened the door, I, I sat in the car, the driver's seat, I turned the engine on, I pulled out of the parking lot, drove down the street, turned around, parked back, because I realized my back was healed. She said, I thought you were crazy. And thank you. I know God heals because I experienced that at that moment. She came in hobbling one minute, and the next minute she was healed in her back. I also know that in the face of death and illness, often God brings healing that is not physical but just as vital as a physical healing. As I was growing up, um, there was not a lot of physical affection in my family with my mother. and My father died when I was six, 
and we didn't have a whole lot of physical affection. I love you. We never said I love you. My mother never told me I love you. Um, and, and she has a great, uh, she inherited that because her father was probably the meanest man in the world. I mean, I kid you not, I was like five or six years old. He, he, he said, Neil, why don't you have one of these peppers? These little, I guess they're habanero peppers. And he said, here, eat this. Well, I trusted my grandfather. It was so hot. And he laughed and he laughed. You can't be mean and serve a five-year-old boy a hot pepper. And I never trusted him. No, that's not true. Uh, our relationship worked out really well. I played dominoes and he loved that. So we, we got along really, really well. Uh, but my mother left the house, moved out when she was 16 years old because of her father. He, he really was a, an unhappy, very angry man. So when I say there wasn't a lot of affection in our home, it's because I never saw my grandparents uh, hug or kiss, and it was a very broken relationship. When I got into college, uh, through high school, got into college and became, had a, a more profound encounter with, G, with Jesus, became a more committed Christian, I, God started healing me. And so I would come home for college and then when I would leave, I would kiss my mother and tell her I love her. And over time, she would follow suit and do that as well. And so we had this affectionate relationship and then several years later a couple uh, um, about 25 years later she was diagnosed with lymphoma cancer and she started uh, in the last year of her life when she realized that her days were numbered she would go around and tell everyone she loved them. I mean, this was my mother. And I said, Mother, why do you do that? She said, I know it makes people feel really awkward. She has bowling league that she played in. And she said, I tell everyone on my team that I love them. And they don't, they, they get the little willies and whatnot. But she said, you know, I don't want to leave this earth without the people who are closest to me knowing that I love them. That was a profound healing, every bit as miraculous as a physical healing. So I know that God can bring good things out of bad events in our lives. But we were not praying for good things in general we wanted diane to be healed what do you do how do you deal with it when you pray for healing physical healing and it doesn't occur and that's what i've been wrestling with all this time these last couple of weeks over again because she's so close to me Because in our gospel, we had two healings, and that's wonderful. And with both of these instances, there was great faith. Jairus believed God could, that Jesus could heal his daughter and brought Jesus to his house. And the woman with the issue of blood, as King James called it, uh, with the hemorrhaging, also had faith if I could just touch the hem of his garment I could be healed and I believe that if you read this passage you will see also that the woman was healed of more than her disease she was healed of her fear she was afraid to, to talk to Jesus she was afraid to let people know what she was doing and she began to sense the healing in her body and then Jesus affirmed that go 
your faith has made you whole. So we have faith. People all over the world are praying for Diane, and Diane is now in the greater presence of God. We live in this tension as faithful Christians. And I think faithful Christians have to believe that God heals. And that's true for today. I've seen it. I've experienced I've been a, an agent of that. And every time I pray for someone to be healed, I expect God to heal them. And it doesn't always happen. So there's this tension between our faithfulness and sometimes our reality that we pray for God's healing, but it doesn't come in the way that we necessarily wanted it. That doesn't diminish the healing of my mother that she experienced in the last years of her life. It is to say that, that we pray, I pray for her healing and her prolonged life. Jennifer Stanton uh, Hargraves has been writing a reflection every day as she's journeyed with her mother as she's been in the hospice. If you haven't been reading it, you really ought to. It's wonderful to journey with her through this time. And she quoted a woman who describes this tension in this way. She said, in one hand, is faith. I believe God can do anything. I'm there. I believe God can do anything. In the other hand is sovereignty. God's sovereignty. Even if he doesn't, I believe God is still good. That is the place of faith. And then she wrote of her own wrestling with this tension between praying for healing and trusting that nevertheless God is good. She writes, with people all over the world praying for my mom, we asked and we believed that God would heal her. However, instead of a physical healing, he is bringing her home as he has this morning. She continues, I have been very aware of this tension, which I have unartfully described as standing on one foot with hope that my will will be done, and on the other foot struggling to accept that my will might not align this time with God's will. And as paradoxical as it might seem, my faith has been strengthened in the unanswering of my way. I choose to surrender to God's will and trust his divine providence. That is the tension I believe that as Christians we all live in. And this is how I resolve that tension. I want to read to you a quote that's been very meaningful for me in this week as I've wrestled with this. It's from Corey Ten Boom. She wrote, Faith doesn't always take you out of the problem. Faith often takes you through the problem. Faith doesn't always take away the pain. Faith gives you the ability to handle the pain. Faith doesn't take you out of the storm. Faith calms you in the midst of the storm. So when we pray for people to be healed and do not see them healed physically in the way we want, We take several approaches. First of all, we look for God's other healing that he often brings about in these circumstances. 
second we don't minimize our grief grief has to take time to run its course and we don't try to rush it on our own and third the resurrection is God's hope that he put in our hearts that Diane is in the arms of Jesus in the fuller life. That promise of the resurrection does not diminish our grief, but neither does our grief diminish our hope in the resurrection. As our psalm said, sorrow lasts for a while, for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Because the last enemy to be destroyed, Paul tells us in Corinthians, is death. And so until that time, we live in this tension, and it's a, it's a necessary tension. Faith doesn't always take you out of the problem. Faith often takes you through the problem. Faith doesn't always take away the pain. Faith gives you the ability to handle the pain. Faith doesn't take you out of the storm. Faith calms you in the midst of the storm. When Job experienced his terrible suffering and he wanted over and over again to have his day in court with God. Why am I suffering? And his friend said, God blesses the righteous people and punishes the unrighteous. And Job said, I know that's generally true, but that's not true in my situation. I want to have my day in court with God. I want to put God in the witness stand. And so God appeals to, appears to him in the whirlwind. And God says to Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the world? Where were you when I put out Orion and Pleiades in the, star, in the sky? And he spoke to Job of his sovereignty and his majesty and his love for the world for what we would call a chapter and a half. And then Job says, I had heard you of you before, but now my eyes have seen you and I repent in dust and ashes. He didn't repent for his sin, he repented for his too small view of God because once he saw God, once he, God appeared to him and he saw in God's eyes the love that God had for him and for the world. All of his questions ceased to be. It didn't minimize his suffering but his vision for God freed him from being totally undone by his suffering. If we just encounter this love that this loving God has for us, then we will know with Julian of Norwich that all shall be well and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. When we grieve, let us grieve well, but let us not lose sight of the fact that, as the psalm that we read this morning tells us, joy will come in the morning. It may not be tomorrow morning, it may not be the morning after that, but it will surely come because God is faithful, God is sovereign, and I, as I trust in him, I am unshakable. Still grieve, 
I still hope. And I hold them in that healthy tension that allows me to walk with my head upright and my heart rooted in the love of God.